Okay, let's talk about the evidence for evolution and a couple competing ideas. Charles Darwin's idea of natural selection and uh, Jean-Baptiste Lamarck's idea of inherited uh, traits or acquired traits. Okay, so let's talk about Charles Darwin. He was an English naturalist. Uh, he was the one who came up with the idea of, not the, the theory of evolution, common misconception. His idea was the mechanism. How do species evolve? How do creatures change over time? And his idea was natural selection. The idea of evolution predated him. Everyone had known for a long time creatures change. The question was how? Now again, when we say theory of evolution, it doesn't mean guess. The theory is a very, very well-tested idea. And he laid it all out in a book, a very famous book, one of the most influential books published in 1859 called On the Origin of Species by Means of Natural Selection, just abbreviated Origin of Species. So let's talk about theory in a broader term. Now a fact is something small, something concrete, something you can kind of look at and see like fact. We have fossils of dinosaurs. Fact, at a certain point in time, about 65 million years ago, we don't really see any more dinosaur species after that. Like, all these little things. Well, you build those together to get something like a confirmed hypothesis. All these different, all right, so I have this hypothesis about, you know, that it was an asteroid that caused the dinosaurs to do thing. And you have all these different facts that, you know, essentially build up to confirm that. What you're looking at when you're looking at a large, large building there, that is a theory. Every single little fact has gone together to build that theory. And it's only when you step back and really look at all those facts and it's like, oh, that's what it's going for there. So when they say, oh, evolution's not a fact, you're right. It's not. It's way, way, way better than a fact. It's made of millions of facts that have all built together to make it. Now, I like this background on Charles Darwin here, and uh, you, can, uh, skip, you can click right here if you want to skip past this, but I think that background on him is very interesting. Charles Darwin was a very, very careful person, so much to the point that he made a pros and cons list for getting married. He essentially made a marry and not marry column. Uh, his marry column, children, uh, charms of music and female chit-chat, and constant companion. And I'm not making that. He said two reasons to marry. It's better than a dog anyhow. She was a lucky, lucky girl. Not Mary. Forced to visit relatives. I get that. I'm, I'm kind of in that same boat occasionally. A terrible waste of time, and he wouldn't have time, and less money for books. That is, wow, that's, I hope she never read that. And if you think I'm making this up, here's his reasons of Mary and not Mary. Better than a dog anyhow, and less money for books. This was the kind of person he was. And I bring this up just to say he was very, very careful. He didn't jump into anything, and he sat back and he waited and he built up evidence before he came to any big decisions. Get it? I select you, naturally. Now, he went on a voyage of the HMS Beetle from 1831 to 1836. His most influential stop, so if you see, he went down here, South America, a bunch of stops there, Galapagos Islands down here, Australia, Australia again, South, Afri or, uh, South Africa, back to South America, and then back up to Europe. Of those, the most influential one was the Galapagos Islands, about 600 miles off the coast of Ecuador. And we'll talk about those more in a second here. So. It was on the HMS Beetle. Some of the evidence that he started to accumulate was about extinct animals resembled living species. That is a sloth. This is a sloth skeleton. Now, he found fossils down there of an animal like this, which actually has, uh, when, when you get close enough and you look at the anatomy, a very, very similar skeleton. The only difference is this one is giant. Uh, the giant sloth was anywhere from 10 to 12 feet tall. Not a small animal, but it looked a lot like one of a living creature. It's, you know, the, the sloth is around now, the giant sloth not anymore, but this one looks like that. This is uh, the three-banded armadillo. Now, there's this uh, extinct creature they found the fossils of called the glyptodon. It lived anywhere from two and a half to ten thousand, or two and a half million years ago to ten thousand years ago. These skeletons actually resembled that of living armadillos. Though clearly these are gone and these are not. By the way, glyptodons were not small. They were approximately the size of a uh, you know small Volkswagen small car. You can kind of see the the difference in size. But there was a lot of similarities in their anatomical structure. Here you can kind of see the uh, size comparison of them but it looked like a living creature, just the fossils of it. This implies that organisms have changed over time. So we have this living one now and then an extinct one there. A living one here versus an extinct one there. So that implied, well, maybe over time they've changed. That's, that's just kind of a little fact that he used to start building it. This means that species are not eternal. Some species died, but living ones looked like dead ones.
Other stuff, species varied locally. These are the Galapagos Islands found out in um, the Pacific Ocean. By the way, the equator runs like right through here, so that's about what we're looking at. But on these different islands here, even on islands that are super close, he found very, very similar creatures. On one particular island, he found uh, Galapagos tortoises with a dome-shaped shell. and others, they had the saddle-shaped shell. And that raised the big question of why. And there was a local governor of the Galapagos Islands who said, I could identify which island a particular shell came from just by looking at the shell. This means that within the Galapagos Islands, every island had slightly different versions of the same creature there. The dome-shaped shell came from Isabella Island, whereas the saddle-shaped shell came from the Española Island. And these islands are not that far apart. I mean, they were separated by a little bit, but not that much. But you found very, very similar creatures with slightly different adaptations on different islands. Each species has evolved to its own unique environment. Next, he had species very globally. It's, it's weird when you think about it. This, uh, these are four different flightless birds inhabiting four very, very similar environments, which doesn't really make sense. I mean, you'd think the same environment should have the same animals there. But this is an emu found in Australia. This is a rhea found in South America. This is an ostrich found in Africa. And this is a cassowary found in Papua New Guinea. These environments here are relatively similar and they have flightless birds, but they have different flightless birds. Why is it that I would have different animals in environments that are pretty much the same? I mean, you could practically pick up any one of these animals and put them in any one of those different places, and they'd do okay. So why have a different animal in what's essentially the same environment? Darwin's idea was natural selection, and creatures change over time through natural selection. The idea is descent, like your descendants, your offspring, with modification over time very, very gradual change. So that's the idea behind evolution. It's very gradual change. Now there's another guy who had this idea about how creatures change over time. His name was Jean-Baptiste Lamarck. Lamarck had the idea that you acquire characteristics and you pass them on down to your offspring. So let's say we have an example, two giraffes here. Both of them are trying to compete for that same high food source. Well, he thought that obviously if food is a little bit too high, you're going to be stretching your neck, stretching a little more and more, and he thought that over time their necks could stretch. And then of course, this is how we get tall neck drafts, because they were short-necked ones, and they stretched their necks out and passed that down. Keep in mind, no one knew what DNA was at the time. Well, Charles Darwin had his different idea with natural selection, which boils down to there is variation, some get to live and reproduce, and others don't. And of course, they have offspring. So here we have some shorter net giraffes. Well, Darwin's idea is a little bit darker, but it's kind of the reality of it. The short ones didn't get to reach up and eat the food. The shorter ones died. So who's the ones who are passing on their traits? Well, those are the, the long-necked ones there. So this was his idea, his competing idea, and his was the only one that actually had the evidence. Lamarck was wrong in his idea. Animals can't acquire characteristics and pass them down, but you will see that the only ones that have the characteristics reproduce and do pass those on down. Now, evolution is one of the most misunderstood concepts in biology. Evolution does not involve trying. Beavers do not cut down trees by saying, chainsaw, 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 yeah! Evolution and natural selection doesn't give an animal what it needs. All it does is change very, very slightly what an animal has over time by only those variations, only those slight differences that help get to survive and reproduce. Any that don't get passed away.